Welcome to Media and Monuments, presented by Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Media and Monuments is conversations featuring industry pros speaking on a wide range of topics of interest to media makers. If you think you need to be in L.A. or New York to have a career as a film producer, think again. I'm your host, Sandra Abrams, and in this episode of Media and Monuments, I'll chat with Sarah Elizabeth Timmons writer, producer, and motivational speaker. She will share how she's been able to carve out a highly successful career without living in Hollywood. In fact, Sarah Elizabeth didn't even study filmmaking at Xavier University where she went to school. But when opportunity knocked, Sarah took it by working on a film in her home state of Ohio. Afterwards, she made the move to LA where she worked as a freelance producer on a variety of projects. In 2008, she started her own production company, Life Out Loud Films. Then she turned around and left Hollywood and moved to rural Virginia where her parents lived. Since then, she's produced films such as Coming Through the Rise starring Chris Cooper and Wish You Well with Ellen Burstyn. She also has worked on McMillions for Mark Wahlberg's company. She's a member of the Academy of Television Arts and Science, SAG, and the Virginia Film Alliance. She's currently juggling 10 projects. So when she has time to sleep, we don't know. Welcome Sarah Elizabeth to Media and Monuments. Thank you, I'm excited to be here. Well, one of the things that I wanted to first ask you right off the bat, I understand you're going to the Cannes Film Festival, which is May 16th through the 23rd. And we're chatting with you before you go to this iconic film event. And I wanted to ask you, you're going there to talk about the upside of falling down, which is in pre-production. Why go there and talk about something that's in pre-production? That's a really good question. And it's a little bit of a unicorn situation. On all my past projects, I have raised the money, made the film, and then you worry about the marketing and distribution. You are always worry about it at the beginning, but that's when you really are able to sell it. And what happened with this particular film is I had found the book and optioned it. And then another producer that I know actually came to me, was looking for YA content, young adult. And so I shared it with her. She fell in love with it. So we decided to team up on the project, but we immediately were able to get the attention of Embankment Films, which is a very prestigious sales company. And what they do typically is they take on a few films a year, and they will pre-sell them at the market. So the nice thing about that is I don't have to raise private equity money, but they'll take it to market as long as it has a strong package, and then they will do sales. And that's how we actually finance the film. Judy and I were able to attach our talent, attach a wonderful director, Oren Zegman, um, Antonia Gentry, and Callum Lynch are actually our two leads. And that's enough of a package to get the buyer's attention, God willing, And so they are going to be selling it. So that is how it's going to be financed. So you're going to come film festival to meet other people to talk more about that film. The sales company will be selling it. So it's in their hands. And so I will just be there to further my network and connections with all those 10 projects that you mentioned. So for me, it's networking. We are meeting with some people involved directly with that project, but really embankment is going to be the ones that are very focused at the market. And then when the market's done, we should know then what our budget is and who the buyers are. And then we'll be in Ireland at the end of the summer starting to shoot. So it'll be a whirlwind. That sounds fantastic. So it's a young adult type of film that you're going for here in this situation. And have you done that genre before? Not the specific genre, but I think that my taste and the films that I create through Life Out Loud Films are all inspiring content, very female forward, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. So it's on brand, but I've not, this is the first time, second time I'm adapting a book. The David Baldacci project was based on David's book, but it is the first time it's YA. And I will say that even though it's a young adult book, we're really working to market the movie itself, not as YA, but it's a romance. It is a romance with an twist that will shock you at the end. So that's what people are really loving about it. Have you been to the Cannes Film Festival before? 
It's crazy. I went for the first time back in 2005 and I had not been back until last year. I went and spoke on a panel and I think I'll probably go every year moving forward because I think that it's very important as filmmakers for us to be networking, to be constantly connecting with other filmmakers, seeing what's out there, understanding the market and doing that in areas and festivals and conferences that are serious. And the truth is when you go to Cannes, that's where all the serious filmmakers are. So I feel like people really take you more serious when you're there. And it just is a totally different caliber of networking than what happens, let's say in a smaller town. It's great. It really, and it's just, it's inspiring. And it doesn't hurt that it's in the South of France. That doesn't hurt at all being in a beautiful setting, but you've been a producer, you're a consulting producer, line producer. Can you talk a little bit about the difference there? What it means to be a producer? Cause it sounds a bit nebulous. It's very nebulous. It's funny because the Producers Guild is set up as the union for producers. And I think that we still feel like our roles are not quite as defined as, let's say, they are with DGA or some of the other unions. But for me and my producing path, I am a producer from concept all the way through distribution. And that is by virtue of having to do it on my own and our first film and, in a sense, proving to people that I could do it. So... I am there from developing the content and the script to setting up the business plan, to raising money, to being on set, overseeing everything that happens, and then also being on board for marketing and distribution. So I say concept through distribution, but not all producers have that same experience. And I will say that now that I did that on three films, I was also the line producer. So I'm the one that's managing the budget, making sure we're staying on budget, on time, all of that good stuff, and very hands-on. But as my career has progressed, I have enjoyed stepping back a little bit and bringing on having producing partners. I'm not the only one that's bearing the weight of the entire production and hiring line producers and other individuals that I would work with. Like for this, we're not raising money. We packaged it and then we'll be there on set to make sure everything goes well, but we will already by then hopefully know who our distributor is and where it's going to go. So it kind of eliminates the two, probably the hardest parts, in my opinion, of making a movie, which is raising the money and then having these investor spaces in your mind every night when you go to bed and trying to get them their money back. And then where's it going to go? Are people actually going to see it? Because that's the other key is it's great if you make a wonderful film, but are you actually getting it seen? And are you able to protect your investors that they get their money back so they'll come on and do another film. So I am very happy that there's some producers that are just creative and put together the deals and have never been on a film set, you know, been on the film set, but not quite as detailed. That's something the money issue can be a big obstacle for people. I know for women in film and video, we have a lot of members who are struggling to raise the money And one of the things, instead of doing a big film, they may do a documentary because the barrier to entry was a little bit lower. Maybe you can fill us in on what's the thing to do if somebody's like, okay, I'm going to start raising money. Is there one thing they need to do? Is there two things they need to do in order to get that investor to come on board? What do you recommend? Yeah, but there's hundreds of things (laughs) that they really need to do. But I I think uh, that's the part where filmmakers get paralyzed, right? They go, okay, that's too daunting. I don't know how to raise money. I don't know how to set up a business and I don't know anybody with money. So it scares them. And I think it stops a lot of people. And it's actually one of the reasons that I started No Film School, No Trust Fund, No Problem is I had to piece it all together on my own, talking to a mentor here, a mentor there, getting back from an investor meeting and like, they would ask for something and I would say, sure, I will absolutely get that to you. And then I go Google what it is and try to figure out how to create the documents. So I started the educational arm of our company to help filmmakers do that because there's a lot of creatives that don't understand the business side and you have to have both in order to be successful. So I think what I would recommend to anyone is educate yourself and take advantage of a program like ours where why reinvent the wheel? Like we literally not only walk filmmakers through everything you need to know because the confidence, you need the confidence there too, right? If I'm going to go talk to investors, I want to understand the structure. 
I want to understand what I'm going to come up against. What are the hard questions I'm going to get? And how do I find these investors? I think educating yourself is key and knowing that you don't have to do it on your own. We have templates of all the legal documents and business plans and help filmmakers create them. And what I find is the second somebody goes, oh, okay, I see it. I just have to fill it in. Then it helps them feel a lot better about jumping into the process. And one of the things that I really do believe about raising money is that everybody assumes that your investors are going to be finance investors. And the truth is because our industry, it's risky, right? We can't promise any investor they're going to get their money back. So how do you have conversations with someone and knowing that it's going to be hard to get their money back? And so what I always tell filmmakers is you've got to find their why. What will make all of this work in the end is that you look at your film. What are my themes? What are my topics? What is it that I'm trying to say? What are the subject matter and the matter of interest that we're addressing? And then find investors that that resonates with them. It's either you are speaking to their personal why. They have a family member that has suffered from dementia or Alzheimer's or they were adopted. And so therefore they want to be a part of a film and get awareness or a certain message out. It could be that it's a business why. They, they just sold a company and they want to write off they need some tax deductions. So that could be why they do it. Section 181 could be very appealing to them. Um, and then there's some that it's all ego, which it's great. It's like, they just, they want to go to the film festivals. They want to be able to come on set and meet the stars. So you want to find what is their why? How do I speak to that why? So that the investor at the end of the day, regardless of whether or not they get their money back, they feel like they got what they wanted out of it. So you're able to check the box and the money is icing on the cake. I love the fact that I just learned about this tax break thing and I didn't know anything about it. Can you just speak to that a little bit more? And how long before you even knew about it? <laughs> oh, God. section 181. And I am not an accountant or an attorney. So this is very layman's terms, but it allows a filmmaker or a investor to deduct the entire amount of their investment in the year you make the film, instead of amortizing it over 10 plus years of the life of the film. So it's a great point that really speaks to a lot of investors because they need that deduction. I'm pretty sure I knew about it from our first film. That's just been something that has just always been part of the pitch in talking to investors. And so you were in Hollywood, you did a film Tattered Angel with Linda Carter, and then you said, I'm going to start my own company. So <laughs> then you moved. So moving out of Hollywood has actually helped you be successful. Why did you say, okay, this is what I'm going to do? And how have you continued to be successful in being outside of Hollywood? It's interesting. So Tattered Angel, the Linda Carter movie, was actually in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then I said, I have to move out to LA. So I went to LA. I was probably there for about seven years. And then the opportunity to shoot our first film arose. Well, I created it. It didn't just appear out of nowhere. But I, I think what I saw after spending years in Hollywood and working on films was, wow, there's such an opportunity to get an entire community in Virginia, which is where my parents had moved, excited about a, the movie and excited to be a part of it. And that is a nostalgia and a novelty that we've lost in LA and New York. People are like, oh gosh, our streets are gonna be shut down. I'm gonna have to take a, another route to work. And it becomes a nuisance, but you go to a small town in Virginia and all of a sudden people were offering up their boats and their houses and extras. And so there was an added excitement. And then I realized too, it was a win-win situation. We could give them something and they were also helping us. And it allowed us to keep our budget extremely low but that quality high. And that's something I would not have been able to do had I stayed in LA. And our next three films were all in Virginia because we had good working relationships with our investors and they wanted to see more. And we just built this community in Southwest Virginia, but obviously there's been a thriving community in Virginia and DC area for a while. So for me, it allowed my company to really start to establish itself and it wouldn't have happened in LA. Now, 
the fact that I'd gone out to LA was very helpful because in the weirdest way, people are, oh, she's a Hollywood filmmaker who has come to Virginia. So that was helpful in going to a smaller market. But look, these days, I never went back to LA except obviously trips. And I worked out of Virginia for goodness, maybe eight years, maybe more, and then relocated down to Atlanta. And what I realized is if you're a producer, you could develop content from anywhere. And one of the blessings of COVID, I hate to say that, but it's true, is that now agents, managers, work's getting done on Zoom. So I've been able, to, I put stuff in storage and when I'd been traveling for the last two or three years because I could do it anywhere. So, you know, I do think it's good to get the experience that might be in a major market or not, but there is a lot to be said for what we can do by leaving that market. So it's been a blessing for you to do that. And getting back with your company, Life Out Loud Films, how did you come up with the name of your film company? I had so many ideas and nothing was sticking. And I haven't thought about this in a while. I think it was like my little black dress productions because a black dress can go anywhere and adapt. But then that had a weird kind of connotation. And so my mother and I had gone to some small town, maybe Carmel up in California. And I bought this necklace that has a quote from, is it Amelia Zola? I think that is something like, I'm here to live life out loud. It's something like that. And I bought a necklace that had this quote on it. And I was like, wait a second, this is speaking to me. I started just running it through my head and I was like, life out loud films. That says it all. Because I wanted something that you hear the name of the company and you get what we stand for. It's live life out. Oh, I'm here to live life out loud. So it came from this necklace and I was sitting there getting ready one day and looking in the mirror going, wait a second, I think this is it. And then I just knew. I love that backstory and finding out how you got the name of your company. Wonderful. But one of the other things about your company is the fact that you want to focus, and you said this earlier, about making impactful films that make a difference in helping women behind the camera, in front of the camera. And you talked about some other things that you're doing with that. But can you just elaborate a little bit more? Why was that the particular focus? You said, okay, this is where I want to focus behind and before and impactful films. I've always been drawn naturally to inspiring content. My entire life, I've been like a walking motivational billboard. And so for me to really see the great power that we could have as producers to really make a positive impact, it's not easy to make a film. And yet to be able to make a film and make a difference, that excited me. That keeps me motivated. I was a motivational speaker talking to high school and college students for 10 years. And so I was on sets of other films and producing when I first went to Hollywood. And I was a little put off by seeing how, pull back the curtain of how films really are made. And I was disappointed in that. It's not what I thought it was. And I remember sitting back going, okay, if I'm gonna put all this time and effort into it, I wanna work on the kinds of films that I care about. And wow, we have such the ability to make a difference. And also it was my experience as a female there. I was acting and producing. So I used to do a lot in front of the camera and every role that I would go out for, my agent would say, wear a short skirt and wear heels and you know everything was sexy. And I remember saying, I don't wanna go out for those roles anymore. So please stop sending me. I stopped going out, no more auditions. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And then as a producer, I was one of the few females back then on a set and just those two things. It's like, I want to be a part of the change. And this is way before hashtag me too. So how can I do that? I could start a company and specifically choose to help champion women, give them opportunities, right? Everyone is complaining that a lot of women might not have the resume that they need to, to take on X job, or that's the excuse that people are giving. Well, everybody needs an opportunity. Everybody needs a first shot. So if I can help develop that, that is exciting to me. And then being able to put content out there that inspires little girls. We believe what we see. So for little girls to have positive role models, not women that are always the victim or the object is important. I really vow that if I'm going to start my company, those are the things that are really important to me. And I want to stay true to that authenticity. And to your question earlier about why leave LA, I think that also part of it is reflecting on myself and not just doing what 
everybody says you should do. The city was not resonating with my soul. So Sarah Elizabeth, what is the life that you want? What do you want that to look like? What speaks to your soul? And you can have all that and still create films. So I think that filmmakers should always really evaluate inside. What are the films I want to work on and work on them? Sometimes you might have to take something for the paycheck, but you have every right to work with people that you love and not work with not nice people. And there's a lot of those in the industry and to work on content that excites you. And so really, and it comes easier when you develop your brand. So that is what we did with Life Out Loud Films. Partly unknowingly and then partly strategically was, all right, people are now going to see our company and they're going to understand what we're about. And so those are the kinds of films that they're going to expect or they're going to approach us about. So creating that really strong brand, I think is important too. And that should start with, what do I want to do? What lights me up? What is authentic? I saw on your Instagram, you have live limitless. What does that mean to you? I walked by, I know I was in London and I took that picture. I think it's very easy for us to accept the expectations and limits that other people put upon us. And I work a lot with indie filmmakers. And I think that one of, one of the things I work a lot on, which seems so simple, is our mindset. We have grown up with expectations and these limited beliefs of what we can't do or imposter syndrome or I'm not good enough or I can't do this or that. And it's like, why not? The world is limitless. Your possibilities are limitless. And oftentimes what limits you is your own mind. And guess what? That's the one thing that you can actually change. So that limitlessness, I do believe in it. And I don't think you could be successful in our industry unless you have that mentality. For me, failure was not an option on my first film. It was like, okay, I'm going to get there. I'm going to reroute. And the road there looks nothing like what I thought it actually would. But I made it there. And so I always encourage filmmakers like, okay, let's get out of your own head. Let's, you tell me why you don't think you can make money doing what you love to do. You tell me why you don't think just because this is your first film that it's not good enough. You know, why can you not pick up the phone and talk to the agent or the manager? Who's telling you this? Okay, is that true? No. Okay, then why is it stopping you? That's a fantastic answer. Thank you so much. So thank you, Sarah Elizabeth, for joining Media and Monuments. Have a great time at the Cannes Film Festival. To learn more about her production company, go to www.lifeoutloudfilms.com. Thank you for having me as a guest. This is wonderful. And I can also say that No Film School, No Trust Fund, No Problem is also our URL where people can go on the education side. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Media and Monuments, a service of women in film and video in Washington, D.C. Please remember to review, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. For more information about WIF, please visit our website at WIF as in Frank, V as in Victor, dot org.